Wars leave long shadows, long-term consequences that people have to deal with for decades after the fighting ends. In China, this is no different, except in China, everything happens on a grand scale. In this video, we shed light on Red China's version of the glorious Emu War, the ill-fated Four Pests campaign where Chairman Mao declared war on the ecosystem. This obviously had some pretty predictable results. Like all really terrible ideas, the Four Pests campaign came from men with great intentions. Mao and his commie mates inherited a very sick China in 1949. Disease was rife and most rural villages lacked sanitation infrastructure. Ten and a half million people were infected with a gut parasite called cystomiasis, which wrecked people's organs. The infection rate of venereal disease was at 10% in rural areas and huge numbers of people were dying from smallpox, malaria and the bubonic plague. Not surprisingly, infant mortality was through the roof. 17% of babies died before they reached age 5 on average, but in some areas this climbed to over 30%. Rural China was ridden with disease and this was a major problem for the new communist state. How was Mao supposed to get enough people to grow food, mine coal and shoot counter-revolutionaries when they kept dying of disease? Sounds like capitalistic selfishness if you ask me. The chairman agreed but quickly realized he couldn't have people shot for dying of disease. Facing a real conundrum, the comrades decided to shoot all the animals which spread disease instead. That way, they at least got to shoot something. Mao's grand vision for a revised Chinese ecosystem was put into action in 1958 at the start of the foster cluck known as the Great Leap Forward. The shortest summary of the Great Yeet Forward I can give you is this. Mao tried to change everything. It didn't work and millions died. That last bit is a pretty common theme in Chinese history and gives you a hint as to where this story is going. So Mao and the boys in red decided to nominate rats, mosquitoes, flies and sparrows for their four pests campaign. The idea was that rats, mosquitoes and flies spread the diseases that were killing off the workers. This part actually made some sense. Rats primarily lived around human settlements and lived off their waste. Outside the cities and villages, rats weren't a key part of the food chain. Mosquitoes and flies also weren't a terrible target as there were many other bugs in the ecosystem that could fill their place in the food chain if numbers were down. Sparrows were a completely different issue. They had only been included in the Four Pests campaign because the government decided that they ate too much. Chairman, not a bird expert Mao's viewpoint was explained in a Time magazine article from 1958. The objection to the sparrows is that, like the rest of China's inhabitants, they are hungry. They are accused of pecking away at supplies in warehouses and in paddy fields at an officially estimated rate of 4 pounds of grain per sparrow per year. Who knew the sparrows had such an efficient and measurable system of grain theft? Tso Tsin Cheng, the only ornithologist China had left after the Civil War, didn't know, and when he asked where the officially estimated rate came from, his name was put on the state enemies list. Bye bye birdie. In fact, the officially estimated rate was a load of bull. Someone in the gargantuan communist bureaucracy had fudged the numbers to hide the fact that the reported grain surpluses didn't actually exist. If you believe these numbers though, sparrows in China were eating around 3% of the country's entire grain output. When adjusted for the grain output in 1958, the sparrows were reportedly eating over 1.8 million metric tons of grain. When Mao saw just how much grain was disappearing into the tiny ravenous beaks of China's sparrows, he knew what had to be done. With the declaration that birds are public animals of capitalism, he called the country to war. 
The campaign began in the countryside but quickly spread to the cities. Divisions of soldiers were formed up in the street as the vanguard to a civilian force over 3 million strong. Armed with scatterguns, nets and cooking pots, this proud volunteer force set out to liberate China's skies from the sparrow once and for all. The newspaper Peking People's Daily proudly proclaimed, No warrior shall be withdrawn until the battle is won. All must join battle ardently and courageously. We must persevere with the doggedness of revolutionaries. The sparrows stood no chance. Initially, they were simply shot wherever they perched, but it wasn't long before China's feathered arch nemesis learned to stay away from the soldiers. The real bird genocide was enacted by people clattering cooking pots in the streets. The scared little birds exhausted themselves flying away from the loud noises and suffered heart attacks in the air. Tens of thousands dropped dead out of the sky. Some birds sought refuge in Peking's extraterritorial embassies. When it was discovered that thousands of sparrows were hiding in the Polish embassy, soldiers demanded entry to scare them away. The Poles told them to shove it, and in response, the embassy was besieged by drummers for days. The sparrows couldn't take it, and the Polish embassy staff had to cart the dead birds out in wheelbarrows, presumably after several sleepless nights and strained diplomatic relations. The call to finally take down their avian oppressors was heeded in the countryside too, where 16-year-old Yang Semun became a national hero for courageously climbing trees to strangle sparrows in their nests at night. Yang was totally not a psychopath, and strangling small birds with your bare hands in the middle of the night is a sign of Chinese patriotism. The war was hard fought, but the glorious Chinese workers were eminently victorious over the four pests. By the end of the campaign, 1 billion sparrows, 1.5 billion rats, 100 million kilograms of flies and 11 million kilograms of mosquitoes had reportedly been killed. While statistics from communist countries are about as reliable as your mate's homemade $4 bill, we can be sure that sparrows nearly went extinct in China. We know this because of what happened in 1960, immediately after the Four Pests campaign's hiatus. Well, as it turns out, sparrows eat far more insects than grain. And what do they like best? Locusts. You can probably see where this is going. After exterminating the sparrow population, Chinese villages were ravaged by probably the worst locust plague of human history. Chinese agriculture was teetering on a knife's edge after the Great Leap Forward mismanagement, and a sudden, countrywide plague of locusts destroyed what was left of the crop. Favourable weather meant that 1958 was supposed to be a bumper year, but instead, it marked the start of the three-year Great Chinese Famine, the worst famine in human history, resulting in the deaths of 30 million people. The countryside was the most affected. Where once the sparrows would have eaten the locusts, instead the locusts consumed entire fields cultivated for human consumption. Remember Tso Tsin Cheng, the last ornithologist in China? Well, after he pestered the communist head honchos for two years, they finally gave in. He had tried to tell them that sparrows ate far more bugs than grain, but it was only in April 1960 when someone actually listened. Sparrows were replaced by bedbugs as a target for the Four Pests campaign, but it was too late. Locusts had already torn the countryside apart. Undoing all their people's work, the Reds imported a quarter of a million sparrows from the Soviet Union in a last-ditch effort to reduce the locust population. Mao's minions never forgot they had been challenged by the greatest Chinese ornithologist when they tried to centrally plan the ecosystem. An investigation was ordered into Cheng's qualifications. The professor was ordered to identify a bird Frankensteined together from the body parts of several different avian species. When he called their BS, the communists decided it was, in fact, a real bird and that he wasn't qualified for the job. After living on a minuscule salary for six years, the Red Guards came for him and looted his house. Professor Cheng was locked up in a cow shed for six months and could only resume his life once Mao had died. He dedicated the rest of his life to educating Chinese students in the fields of bird conservation. 
After he died, a species of rodent and sparrow were named after him. The truly criminal end to this story is that the architects of the catastrophe, Chairman Mao, refused to stop exporting China's grain. Desperate to look like the big successful communist in the eyes of the world, Mao sold what little food his people had left to other communist countries. Knowledge about the Communist Party's failings was banned and China's tradition of imprisoning journalists for speaking out was kicked into overdrive. That was the ridiculous story of the Four Pests campaign and the carnage that ensues when government starts inventing its own facts. But what do you think? Could the famine have been lessened if the government had actually listened to the people who knew what they were doing? Do you think killing all the flies would damage the ecosystem? Was Yang Semun exhibiting early signs of psychopathic behavior? Let us know all of this and more in the comments section below. And just before you run off to those suggested videos guys, if you're looking for high quality history videos that explore a whole range of errors and topics, then make sure you check out our new channel, The Braved, we post new uploads every week. And if you're more into the music side of things, we also have our Relax Jack, where we use some of the music posted there, here on the videos here on the front. And if you just want to help support the channel and get access to a behind the scenes Discord where you can chat to myself and the team, as well as exclusive videos, then consider donating to the Patreon. And if you just want to join our wider community, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Discord. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.